All righty. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Walisha Wilson. I am the founder of New Life Second Chance Outreach Incorporated. Thank you so much for joining us for our last event of Reentry Awareness Month, which our friends and our guests from Georgia Justice Project wanted to let me share this right quick. Are you all able to see the screen? Okay. So in this in in this meeting, you all are going to learn and find out more about who can and who can't vote in Georgia, why you should vote, how you may be able to vote in Georgia with a felony what to do if you are able to vote in Georgia um, with a felony, what to do if you're on probation, what to do if you owe fines, fees, or restitution, how to vote if you're in jail, and hear about how you may be able to terminate your probation early if you're uh, qualified, how to get a pardon, and how to request a certificate of sentence completion, and there'll be other questions. And you may not even get a chance to ask your questions because their, their webinars are always so thorough, but by the time you get ready to ask something, they've already answered it. Um, and so we just want to again say thank you. Uh, this was our eighth year of having Reentry Awareness Month recognized by the governor throughout the state. Uh, normally July is our biggest uh, month of the year. We have tons of events in person and virtual that we do this month. And so this um, is great to close our month out with information as we started on the first in Columbus uh, with voter education and we're closing out the month. Uh, with some education and voter education. And so we would like to um, just highlight that and we're looking forward to the work that we'll be doing next year. Um, and say thanks to all of those who donated uh, for this month, as well as our partners and our sponsors, Heisen Simons Foundation, Restore Georgia, the DeKalb County Public Library, Elysium Consulting, Fair Count, New Way of Life, Hope Coalition, ProMed Consulting, Down Home Southern Catering, Taking Charge, LLC, as well as Beauty and Body by Egypt. So we appreciate all the support that we got uh, during this month uh, for our events. Uh, the mission here at New Life is to end mass incarceration by equipping, empowering, and restoring socially, economically, and civically disadvantaged Georgians impacted by an arrest, conviction, or incarceration. And what we do is we serve as a resource hub for individuals that have anything on their record that keeps them from getting a job or housing. Although we specialize in sharing things regarding jobs and entrepreneurship, we do occasionally get resources in, whether it's food closet and voter education, uh, whether it's a few landlords that may say they have housing for rent. So we do have we send those out to individuals as well as those who work with folks who are justice impacted. And um, just a quick, quick proclaiming, we won't talk about it too much since most of this time will be spent with uh, GJP talking and then we'll have some Q&A at the end. But just know you in this space, we wanna do our best to humanize individuals, not use terms such as inmate, prisoner, convict, felon, offender, um, and lead with person, person who's incarcerated, person with a felony, person on probation. Um, and so that's with anybody to give folks their humanity back. And these are just ways to connect with us via email, our website, and our social medias. And of course, this slide will go out uh, at the end of the event, as well as with um, the slide that Ann and Dominique will present as well. So without further ado, we will have our guests, Ann Colleton and Dominique Harris of Georgia Justice Project. Ann is a policy and outreach coordinator. Is that correct, Ann? And then Dominique is the outreach associate at Georgia Justice Project. And so from this point, we will have Dominique is gonna lead off and then we'll follow up with Ann doing her presentation. And again, before they do that, I wanted to say thank you, thank you, thank you to all of our sponsors uh, and those who joined us. And we will make sure we shout them out as well again uh, before we end. Hey, how is everyone doing today? Like um, Alicia said, my name is Dominic Harris, and I'm the Outreach Associate with George Justice Project. And today we're going to be talking about Georgians and their voting rights. 
their, their agenda is just to clarify the Georgia law. So that's the criminal legal system and how it impacts voting, who's eligible to vote in Georgia, the first offender exception, fines and fees, sentence completion certificate, early termination of probation, our um, resources and material, a couple of voting quizzes and scenarios, and um, some, Q, some Q&A, and lastly, um, some information on expungement, the, our, our front-end defense lawyers and pardons and driver license suspensions. Our focus today is basically to educate, engage, empower this 450,000 Georgians that have completed their felony sentence and are eligible to vote. That's very important. Like 450,000 Georgians can vote and have to mobilize and try to figure out how to engage them. The second one in 2021, the new early termination law passed that helps close to 175,000 Georgians that are on probation have that potentially eradicated after three years. And 40,000 people are on first offenders or conditional discharge and eligible to vote. So um, just to impact the community and the, um, the democratic process. There's a lot of voter, voters apathy, people not wanting to vote. A lot of times it's because of confusion, focused on like up the ballot and not a lot down the ballot. So some of the opportunities of voting, like the system have touched these people's lives. Like I'm just as impacted and the system have touched our lives. So you got to reiterate, we're going to reiterate that voting locally like your your district attorneys your solicitor generals your sheriffs your judges your state representatives like all these people get elected but we only focus on the president so we try to just really educate and engage people about the total democratic process because we understand these challenges that are on the right side distrust in the distrust in the system fear of being a second class citizen lack of understanding of the electoral process and missing misinformation about their own voting rights so just reiterating that voting is local, it's not just a federal type of race. These are some numbers in Georgia, um, NATO and the United States. So as you can see, Georgia is at the top and this is incarceration rates. So that means that we all know that you, the United States incarcerates more people in the whole world. Well, Georgia accordingly incarcerate well when we, we are um above average in the united states because this number the second line this is the average of the united states and we're above average in the united states and the united states incarcerates the most people in the world so we're above average in the whole world this is cost for control um cost of control accounts for people that are in, incarcerated on probation and parole similar to the last slide Georgia um, incarcerates, not incarcerate, but has more people that are on cost of control, not only in the United States, but in the world. We lead the world in cost of control. So that means we put more people on probation than the entire world, including our own country. These are some more numbers. Ooh, oh, sorry. One second, y'all. My Zoom went off. Okay. These are some numbers, basically, just um, reiterating the fact that I just stated. We're number one in the world in cost of control and probation and fourth in incarceration rates, but we're only 26 in crime rate. We're around half the pack, but we lead the pack. So, you know, this is a, a lot that we have to tackle and try to understand, but it's a big push toward or it's a big feeling that we have a problem in Georgia with incarceration and putting people on long probation sentences. It's some more information about mass incarceration and its roots, um, federal disenfranchisement roots. So about 200,000 Georgians are currently disenfranchised. That's serving um, a sentence. So only approximately around 25,000 of them are incarcerated. The other 170 are out and on probation um, or parole, some type of DCS supervision. We know the criminal legal bar barriers to um, political suppression of political, I mean, I'm sorry, suppre suppression of political power, which started with the 13th Amendment that outlawed slavery, but continued the exception based on if someone got locked up and created all these black codes and 
that dealt with locking people up for unemployment and vagrancy and all these simple charges to leave a person locked up for no reason and basically continue this institution of slavery. Um, in 1877, felony disenfranchisement was added to the Constitution, which increased po policing and made sentencing options more strict, I would say, which leads to mass incarceration and really is the foundation of why this system is like it is today. So we are at GJP, we advocate to go against this. And um, at the bottom right here, you can follow this no taxation without representation that's led by Imam Atlanta. It's basically a vote in my honor campaign, whereas you shouldn't have to vote. We shouldn't be paying taxes if you can't vote. It's just that simple. Like, why am I paying? Why am I paying taxes every time? I, every time I turn around, if I can't vote. So, um, this bit at the bottom is a, a campaign to try to, you know, remedy some of that disenfranchisement. This is another map. There's some more statistics. A lot of people don't understand that each state has individual rights in Georgia you don't lose your rights to vote permanently. I think it's only you know, one state forces people to lose their um, rights based on a felony conviction, but we're gonna focus on Georgia. And in Georgia, once your felony conviction is complete, that's sentence complete and off paper, you just gotta go register and you can vote. So who can vote in Georgia? Back to that question. Simple ways to just remember this stuff. Anyone currently serving a, anyone not currently serving a felony conviction. Upon completion of your sentence, your right to vote is automatically restored. You do not have to have your record expunged or pardoned. Sentence completion means completion of probation, prison sentence, and parole, including all non-report status or unsupervised status. Anyone on a first offender or conditional, in, conditional discharge sentence can vote as long as that status has not been revoked. Anyone in jail, unless they're serving a felony sentence. So that's anyone in jail that is waiting on a trial. That has, you know, anyone in jail that is not serving a felony sentence can give can vote. Anyone serving a misdemeanor sentence can vote. When your felony probation and parole is complete, you just need to register and go vote. Fines and fees. This is a very elusive topic, but they don't matter. Just that simple. Once your sentence is over with, that's completion of probation, parole, and your your um your prison sentence, you can vote. According to the Secretary of State website, fines that were imposed as a condition of probation are automatically counseled upon com completion of probation. And your sentence and your felony consent is complete even if you have outstanding monetary obligations, such as unpaid restitution, fees, costs, or surcharges. So that means as soon as your felony consent is over with, you can vote. It's just that simple. Now, people run into things like red tape where people don't want to, you know, the system don't want to recognize that the sentence may be over with. This is a sentence, um, a sentence completion certification. It's not needed, but if you're going through some, a situation where your your um your sentence is not being recognized as complete, this is something that you can get to just help you get a peace of mind and just to show that um that your sentence is complete. You can also you can reach out to your PO. To get this form, you can also get a, um, a letter from your pr probation officer indicating that your um, sentence is complete, or you can get a court terminate a court order showing that your probation was terminated and your sentence is complete. Georgia has the longest probation sentences in packed and voting. Like this is more number. Georgia has the longest probation sentences in the country. We're three times longer than the national average. Forty percent of Georgians probation sentences are longer than 10 years. 175,000 people are currently serving a probation, a probation sentence in Georgia and they're disenfranchised voters. Current practice of non-report and unsupervised status after two to three years, but they still can't vote. So that means someone may be on probation and they might not have reported in two or three years or maybe even four years. They might think the status is okay, but they still can't vote because maybe they have six years left. We're trying to really reinforce that after that three years, we're trying to advocate that they can come off probation because I'll reiterate that there, there's 175 Georgians that are on probation. And if we can tackle that, 
we can have a lot of people come off probation and add to that 450,000 that are currently able to vote. Just for more clarity, um, a number right here. So since the bill got passed, 20,000 Georgians have got their probation terminated. That's a good thing. You know, we try to always, I know it's tough to, to vote and do all these things, but we always got to point out the positives. It's 20,000 Georgians that have got their probation terminated since the law. Um, and I always reiterate that after three years of serving probation, you may be eligible as long as you haven't had any new arrests, excluding um, traffic charges, no revocations in the past 24 months. But this is where the fines, um, I'm sorry, this is where restitution comes in, not fines, but restitutions come back in, get your um, probation terminated. And this is just some information to um to keep to find out if you qualify for early termination. DCS should start the process. You don't need an attorney. You can call your probation officer or call DCS. And this is the number. If you are non report and, and request early termination, they should tell you what they're supposed to tell you, the next steps you have to go through. Or you can go to our website and where well, you should go to our website and understand some of the things you should ask them when you're inquiring about this information. It could take up to 60 to 90 days. And remember that the judge still has to approve the, um, the hearing or, you know, the early termination. And at the bottom is just our, um, our website that you can reach out to, probation at gjp.org. And then we'll go answer questions about the, the problem in the process. I would reiterate this while Alicia just pointed to this. We want to use people centered language. Because a lot of times, even with voting, the fear is the fear comes from marginalization and kind of like dehumanizing people. So we always want to use people centered language instead of felon. We you say person with an arrest record or a conviction record, um, person living with a felony, a person with a felony record, returned citizen, injected, justice impacted person, person impacted by the um, criminal system, or formerly incarcerated person instead of inmate, former inmate. X kind, all those derogatory terms. Three points to to remember. I always remember this basic canvassing guide. In my opinion, this would be your basic canvassing guide. If someone is asking if they can vote or if they are eligible to vote, three things to remember. Is your sentence complete? If the answer is yes, there is no need to ask any more questions. They can vote. If they say no, you ask them, are they um, under first offender or conditional discharge? And if their status had been revoked, they say, no, okay, you go on to the next question. Have they been on probation for three years or more? They may be eligible for early termination. Remember, that, remind them that fines and fees do not matter when it comes to voting. And that if their sentence is complete, they're eligible to vote. They just have to re-register and go vote. This is some of our um, material that we're willing and happy to give to anyone or any organization on this call, on this call free of charge. These are yard signs, posters, and voting postcards to be dispersed to the community in the best way possible. So after the call, like um, any anyone that needs any of this information is more than welcome to um, reach out to me or Ann and request it. Um, so I guess I do one of these scenarios, Ann. I'll start first. Sure. Test some knowledge. Uh, which one? I'm going to do one of overcoming fear. I've got a vote, couple of voting scenarios just about what a person may be going through as they're going down the um, path of voting just to get you guys, I'm, you know, accustomed to what people may be feeling and thinking. I'm going to do one about fear. And it's, it's based on uh, which one I want to do. I do Emma. So Emma. So Emma just finished her pro parole sentence for a serious crime, she is no longer under any form of supervision and is eligible to vote. However, Emma is scared that voting might attract negative attention from her former, her former parole officer or community members who still might view her as marginalized due to her old charges. What would we tell Emma to kind of encourage her that she can vote and participate in democracy? Because this is a big thing that people will go through like what would we tell Emma? How would we communicate with Emma? Good 
feel free to unmute and brainstorm together. Well, I will start. I would say for one, congratulating her for being off parole, okay. but also to validate her fear that, you know, with mm -hmm. me myself being formerly incarcerated, who had that same fear, especially if you're coming from a place of shared experience, I think you definitely should leave with that. Um, but just let her know that having that fear is understandable, but to also know that there really is no fear to having it because she has that right to vote just like anybody else has that right to vote. And um, by using her vote basically is her voice and she can use that to change the very same system that is causing her fear. And so that's how I would kind of address it. I like that. I like that. That's very important, um, Walisha, because I, I'm pretty sure you know, but I run across a lot of people and they just like, I can't vote. I hit you, can't vote. Then I give them the information and they still don't want to vote. <laughs> like, so now, then it turns into fear. So that's very important as far as like accepting that vulnerability, but then using that vulnerability to, to empower her or him. So, and you want to do one? Sure. And I'll say one thing we were, I was talking about this in area with some other people once, and they said, have her invite someone to go with her, you know, so that you feel safety by having someone else there with you in case something does happen, you know, you have somebody else with you and you can support one another. Um, okay. So this is sort of like eligibility quizzes because this might come up. So Janice lives in LaGrange. She completed her 12-year probation sentence in 2018, but was never able to pay the $10,000 in restitution she had in her case. Can she register and vote in Georgia? You can put something in the chat. You can unmute. You think she can vote or not? Yes, yes, Miranda, she can, yes. Yes, she can. Because her sentence is complete and restitution does not matter if her sentence is complete. I'll read one more. Um, Malone was convicted of a felony in Maine in 2012 and served eight years in prison there. While in prison in Maine, he voted twice because there is no felony disenfranchisement in Maine. He was released on parole in 2020 and was able to transfer his supervision to Georgia because he has family here. Can he register and vote in Georgia while on parole for a main felony conviction? Yes or no? <laughs> I would say yes, since he didn't have his felony in Georgia, maybe. Yeah, it's, I, it's a tricky I, question. I, Anybody, I, what a lot of people think. I would say no, because regardless of where he got locked up at, he is currently on paper in the state of Georgia, and the state of Georgia says you cannot vote while you are currently on probation or parole. That is correct. 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 Right. So, but just remember, remember Dominique said that map of how every state has different laws. So, right, there's someone that we might have heard of who was convicted in New York, but he's registered to vote in Florida, right? So in New York, he can vote in Florida. If he was convicted in Florida and is still on probation, he would not be able to vote. However, Florida, because he was convicted in New York, Florida defers, Florida's voting law defers to the state of conviction. So that's why this certain person that we all know is able to vote in Florida, even though he's serving a felony sentence. But if he was trying to register to vote in Georgia, he would not be able to. Question? So I think one of the lessons also to be learned is if you're going to be moving and transferring your probation, it's probably good to look at the state that you're actually planning on moving <laughs> to because laws do vary in very different ways. Because I can, I could definitely see myself being upset if I was in a state mm -hmm. that allowed me to vote while I was still under on paper, only to move to a state that says now I cannot vote. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one of the key things too that. I always get what people call and ask about it. And they say, well, had I known that, I never would have moved to Georgia. 
because I want it to, I want to be able to vote. Um, so I guess that would be a key thing too. Andrea, you got a question? Hi, yes. Thank you for um, presenting this. Um, I I have been in a couple of these. I love Georgia Justice Project. Um, so thanks again. And um, I wanted to talk about the financial part of probation parole and the time part of probation parole because for whatever reason I still get confused about what quote unquote on paper means and um, the money that is owed so I think that my question is I'm trying to put it in like a yes or no if your time frame is served but there's still money's outstanding you can vote yes okay you good time is served if you're off paper like so if so say you have a 20 20 year sentence is split sentence uh uh 20 to 15 you did your 15 in prison you come home you do your five on paper but you got twenty thousand dollars in restitution the restitution don't matter pertaining to voting okay so on paper is time Yes, that's on paper just means supervision. How much okay, supervision. I keep thinking on paper is something to do with money. I don't know why, but okay. No, yeah, that's so just on like, paper is time. Yeah. And like, so the, the bad part is you can keep owing for forever and ever and ever and not be on parole or probation and vote. But you just owe forever for no good reason. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, and I would say we, we, we still use the word, the phrase off paper sometimes that we start, I've started to shift to is your sentence complete because there is sometimes that confusion of what does on, off paper mean. Um, but I will say just if you look at this slide, which I think is sharing, right? Mm -hmm. I, when your probation ends, fines are canceled. When the time runs out, your fines are canceled because DCS is the only entity that collects those fines. It's not a court or anything else. So I, I think the question of what happens to unpaid things when you're off probation, what happens to those aside from voting? I don't know the answer to that. Like, I think that potentially they could, but, but in terms of voting, they don't matter. So what happens to those? I know fines are canceled, but the other things, I'm not sure what happens with those. So I don't, don't want to steer somebody to say that they are out there or they may not be out there. Okay. Not, so. And so just um, to, to be, sorry to be like obtuse or pedantic, but just to make sure also when you speak about sentences, we're, we are talking only about a time frame. We are not mm -hmm. talking about, okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, there are a lot of nuances and, and, um, confusing part. So uh, it's okay. You want to ask a couple more? Yeah, I have one. Um, Sheila is 42 years old and lives in Valdosta. She's been voting since she was 18 years old until, 2020, until 2016 when she was convicted of a felony. She completed her probation sentence in 2023. What does she need to do in order to vote in this election? Would she need to re-register to vote um, in order to, to just re-register to vote? Yep, that's it. Yep, exactly. Re-register. You do that's have, it. yeah, because she has the right to vote, just like anybody who turns 18 gets the right to vote, but they have to register to kind of mm -hmm. take advantage of that right, so. Um, all right, here's a question. Roderick is serving a First Offender Act felony sentence in Autry State Prison. He will then have four years of probation after he's out of prison. Can he register and vote in this election while in prison? No. No. Mm. I say yes. Well, <laughs> let me let me think. Okay, because he has, he first offender sentence. First offender status, though. Mm -hmm. it's not. It hasn't been revoked 
He just in prison. He is in prison. I changed my mind. I changed my mind. I'm over the years. Got to think about it. Right. No, he so, can. Yes, he can. I mean, that's confusing because like if he was on probation for his first offender sentence and it got revoked and he was sent to prison, then he couldn't. But he's just that like, plenty of people, unfortunately, are sentenced under the First Offender Act and still go to prison. It's not revoked. It's just part of their sentence. So they can this person um, can vote while in prison because he's sentenced under First Offender Act. And so, Anne, let me ask you a question. I was sentenced under the First Offender Act, and I, I can recall it wasn't until after I got out, and I think one of the very first webinars I had heard from y'all was that being under the First Offender means you haven't been convicted. But technically, in order to go to prison, you have to have been convicted. So how is it possible that someone is able, why is pr prison or incarceration even an option for a person who has not been convicted? Because you would think that actually locking somebody up really is a sign of them being convicted. So technically, if I haven't been convicted of anything, question. why are people being allowed to be incarcerated? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Because they haven't been conv convicted. I thought incarceration was for people who have been convicted. Yeah. 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 That's a, a legal question. technicality <laughs> I don't want to wade into. <laughs> okay. Great I don't question. know. But yeah. I mean, I a judge, so incarceration is not the key thing to be looking for. So technically, there are people it's about in somebody's prison. sentence. It's about their sentence. It's okay. what is their sentence, right? And I think they would say something like, "I'm just shooting in the wind. We, your sentence is to incarceration, something like that." They have to figure out the wording. You know, they play with the words a lot. Right. Like they'll try to figure out the wording. So it it it'll be something like as far as the punishment, like. I don't know, like, cause that's a great question, Wally. Mm -hmm. Like, cause why am I in prison under, but I'm not convicted of anything? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Same thing with the show on your record. Like a conditional sentence. So, I mean, you are <laughs> the wording. Yeah, I know. Exactly. I know. Yeah. <laughs> so, Gay asks, "How do you know if you're sentenced under the First Offender Act?" That's a great question. So, a First Offender Act sentence is different than someone's first felony conviction. It could be. Mm -hmm. But just because it's your first felony does not mean that you're sentenced under the First Offender Act. So typically, frequently, the person will know because that was told to them by the judge. But if they don't know, um, you can always look at their sentencing paperwork. And there's often a box that's checked like, yes, you were sentenced under the First Offender Act and the code name, the code number mm -hmm. um, is listed there. Um, or conditional discharge. We often talk about first offender, but conditional discharge is a similar kind of sentence where um, it's not considered a conviction unless his status gets revoked. So, um, and as Dominique mentioned earlier, that's 40,000 people who have that kind of felony sentence who don't often realize that's not a conviction. I never lost my right to vote. I can use that power that I have. So if you know anybody, <laughs> spread that word. That's a, that's a lot of people. So, Anne, um, while we're there on that topic, can you sure. talk briefly, since we're on this whole thing about the first offender, can you talk briefly about retroactive first offender? When she asked, how do you know if you're on it? What if you were uh, something and you did not take first offender? Can you talk briefly about getting it retroactively instated? Um, yeah, well, we'll talk about that later. Oh, After okay. we're done with voting, I'm going to talk about the kind of expungement options, but I just want to okay. be, I don't want to confuse the two because you don't need your record expunged or pardon in order to vote. And so that's kind of why we're saving that part toward the end. <laughs> as okay. a uh, but let's do one more scenario and then um, we'll talk about um, other things that GJP does. So John McDaniel lives in Vidalia, Georgia. He has been off probation for 10 years, but when he tried to register to vote four years ago, they sent him a letter saying he couldn't vote because he was still serving a sentence for a felony conviction. He has been completely off paper for 10 years, not just on non-report or unsupervised probation status. He said he doesn't have a, a concurrent sentence for a different felony, and he hasn't had any new charges since then. What can John do to correct his voter registration status? Because, right, he is eligible, right? But they're telling him he's not. So what can he do to correct that? Go to the Board of Elections? 
Well, it's the Board of Elections who's telling him he That's can't. Telling vote. him that. Okay. Dominique talked about this earlier. So does he can he um I'm sorry, can can he show like proof, like the, the mm -hmm. certification or the certificate that exactly. that says that he's completed? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So he's not, he shouldn't have to do that, right? I mean, it should be that DCS, the Department of Community Supervision, communicates to the Secretary of State and says this person's off paper. Every once in a while, it doesn't happen smoothly, um, and but he can get the certificate of sentence completion from any DCS office and um, and then show that to the voter registration office. I would say rather than just saying, no, I'm off paper and try to register again, they're just going to say the same thing. But you have to, unfortunately, in this situation, you do have to show proof. You shouldn't have to. But in this situation, since there's some screw up happening, he pr brings that certificate to the voter registration office. Um, and we're happy to help with that if if there is some um, confusion um, or something like that. If, if it doesn't work for the individual to walk into the voter registration office and show that certificate, we can also help get involved in that if needed. So, Anne, um, my son is just as impacted and he is off, off for everything. And he went to online to look at, to register to vote. When he put his information in, it said he was already registered to vote. Um, but then when he tried to, um, when he put it back into another site on that same website, it's like, we have no information on you. Hmm. So it's, you know, it's taking it back and forth. He got a little frustrated. I said, hold on, we're going to figure this out. Yeah. But, uh, he has his letters and stuff. So I, I believe the best course of action for him is to go down to the board of elections then to, to don't, don't mess with the website. And I right. Mean, other people and it frustrates them. Yeah. Yeah. What, my voters page? That's, that's the website you're using? Yes. Mm hmm. And you can call the voter registration office too. Um, I can, I'll screw up the screen sharing if I put it in the chat, but the, you can call a voter registration office too and say, you know, this is my name and date of birth. Sometimes it shows this, you know, and I just want to clarify that I am, I've, it's active and I am able to vote and ask them if not, why? And so um, I can, I can share that. Um, I know that link, if you go to our website and you go to the FAQ or one of those, there's a link there to the voter registration offices or going in person. Thank you. Sure. Well, we have some more scenarios, but I feel yeah. like for this sake, yeah, just put the time. link in the chat. Can I ask a quick? Oh, thanks. Sure. Uh quick question and it might be portending for something later on but just in in this environment of voter disenfranchisement I'm wondering if you guys have collected any stats on this happening to people when it should not be happening to people especially with the the name match kind of stuff that's occurring and um if because of that is there any other any other recourse than just going to the, the Board of Corrections to get your paper reissued or issued to you? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know statistics. I mean, I know it does happen, um, but I don't know. I mean, generally, I think it works, but a percentage wise or anything like that, I don't know. And so for that, you know, for that person who it happens to, it's really, it sucks. Um, so, yeah. Um, okay, well, if if we can shift just to, we're going to talk now about kind of, oh, and I guess the, the, all this Alicia will, will send in as I already put it in the chat. But so now we talked mostly about Georgia Justice, I mean, about voting, but Alicia also wanted us to talk about some of the other things that Georgia Justice Project does. Um, so our mission is to reduce the number of people under um, correctional control, and to reduce barriers to reentry. So we do that. We represent people. We work with a lot of lawyers. We represent people in cases in court. We also engage in policy reform to change laws, to remove those barriers. And then we do a lot of education and outreach like this as well. 
So this is kind of a summary of, and this, we have these cards, if, if you work with people and want cards like this, we, these are kind of summarizes the three basic things that we do in our office. So I'm going to go through those um, now. So um, Dominique already talked about early termination of probation, right? Um, 175,000 people are on probation. 20,000 have gotten off early already, um, but more people are eligible. And so our website has more information there. Generally, somebody can do that without an attorney, but we are there to assist if there's, there's problems. So I'm going to talk about the other two things listed here. So um, on the front end, we do provide um, criminal defense only in Fulton and DeKalb counties. We re represent people who have a, a felony or a misdemeanor in those states. Um, similar to the public defender, we work with people who can't afford to hire a private attorney. Um, but what makes us unique is we have very small caseloads. Everyone is paired with not just an attorney, but a social worker to address any issues that got them caught up in the system. And we support them and their family. If they happen to be incarcerated, for the entire time that they're incarcerated, bring them and their, you know, connect them and their family, bring their kids and family members to visit and support people when they are released as well to assist with reentry. Um, we do have um, a restorative justice program that is in Douglas and DeKalb counties. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on that, but we can we can talk about that a little bit if you'd like as well. Um, expungement is another thing that we are known for because there's, um, we work, that's kind of the biggest part of what we do. So, um, so expungement is not related to voting, but <laughs> it is what we do. We, um, we really focus on expungement as a way to remove barriers to employment and housing. So expungement is a two-step process. You restrict the record in the GCIC database, the Georgia Crime Information Center, and then you seal the court records. It's very important to do both of those steps because when a private background check company, when an apartment complex or a job does a private background check, they go to the courthouse. And so you have to do that second step of, of sealing to do that. So ideally, this would be an automated system where that, you know, certain number of years later, certain charges that it would just go away. We're working on that, but um, for right now, you know, it's a laborious process. So people can get arrests off their record that are non-convictions, right? A lot of people don't even know that those stay on, <laughs> um, even if uh, you weren't um, convicted. But so current law is that you can clear two misdemeanor convictions from your record. We hope that that will be changed and there won't be a limit on that. But right now, four years after the date of the conviction, you can get two misdemeanors restricted and sealed. And then felony convictions that you've gotten a pardon for, those can be um, potentially restricted and sealed five years after you off paper. So I'll talk about pardons more specifically in a minute. But once something has been pardoned, you can seek a pardon five years after your, your full felony sentence is complete. Five years later, you can seek a pardon. Once it's been pardoned, certain charges are eligible for restriction and sealing. But there are certain offenses that are excluded from that, unfortunately. Um, but that's kind of the basic overview. There are other options, as Alicia was alluding to. Retroactive first offender is one of them. So if you have a um, were convicted of something, but you and it was potentially eligible for the first offender act, but it was not offered to you at the time that you were sentenced you potentially can go back and ask the judge to resentence you under the First Offender Act. And then what, I, what had been a conviction would then become no longer a conviction. Um, I don't know all the nuances and details about when that is possible. So, um, but, um, and I think the next slide will talk about it um, a little bit more. But then there's also, for people who are survivors of human trafficking, there's a lot more options to clear a record if your charges were related to being a survivor of human trafficking. So, um, and so if you wanna go deeper into all of this and what is possibly eligible, you should um, attend our first Friday session. Um, we do that the first Friday of every month and it's a 45 minute virtual presentation. Anyone is welcome to attend to learn kind of more in depth about this. And that is really the first step to our intake process where you you listen to that, you learn, okay, yeah, I'm eligible. I want to apply for help from GGP. Or you learn and you listen, okay, my charge is not eligible yet. Um, 
you know, I'm still on probation or I've just been off paper for a year or my charge is currently one that the law won't allow me to get my record cleared. So that's why we start with that um, first Friday presentation. We also have desks, expungement desks that kind of streamline the process um, in Cobb, Athens, and Augusta um, that, um, that streamline that process. So, and we also do um, summits around the state when a prosecutor is interested in, in streamlining streamlining that process for people. So, um, so if we're talking about felony convictions, the first step to getting a felony record cleared is to get a pardon first. So it's an official order of forgiveness from the state. <clears throat> um, and it's granted by the State Board of Pardons and Paroles. And it has to be for a Georgia record, not another state. Um, the parole board grants about 500 per year of these. Um, usually for felonies it can be for misdemeanor convictions as well um any offense is potentially eligible for, to be pardoned um it does not the pardon itself doesn't restrict and seal the record but it, if you get pardoned then you are eligible to apply for record restriction and sealing under what we call sb 288 the law that was passed a couple years ago um, there is no cost to apply, but it is a quite extensive online application. When it was on paper, it was 14 pages, um, and it requires a lot of, you know, letters of recommendation and interviews and stuff like that. So it's a very extensive process. It takes a lot of time. So um, if somebody, so the criteria is that you were convicted of a felony, you've been off paper, completed probation and parole for at least five years, um, and you have to have, quote, lived a law-abiding life for the five years prior to that, so not have any other charges. Um, and then you have to, for a pardon, you have to have paid your fines and restitution. I mean, you can't have any other pending charges in order to apply for a pardon. Um, and then, and we do, we do assist people with pardons, so... Um, if that's, if you meet this criteria or someone you know does, they're welcome to reach out to DDP, attend our first Friday, and then go from there about um, getting assistance with a pardon. And then I just want to bring up another law that we helped get past this um, legislative session. It has to do with driver's license suspension. So uh, um, it that can start a cycle of getting somebody caught up in the system, right? If And so it can be for as simple of a reason as you missed court day, right? You got a ticket for speeding. Who hasn't, right? But you really, you didn't pay the ticket right away either because you forgot it got lost in the shuffle of your messy desk or you just knew you couldn't afford it. So you just pretended it wasn't there and you, you know, just avoided going to court. Um, for whatever reason, then you're charged with an FTA, failure to appear. And when that happens, even if it was just a speeding ticket, 10 miles over the speed limit, not something really serious, right? But if you don't show up to court, they automatically suspend your driver's license. So very counterproductive process, right? It doesn't make sense to suspend somebody's license so then they can't drive to work, so they can't earn the money that they need to pay the ticket. But that's what they do. So... And I think it's 105,000 people get their license suspended every year, not because of dangerous driving, but because they miss traffic court. So currently they can still suspend that license, but it now is much easier to get your license reinstated if that happens. So if, you, if your license was suspended for an FTA, all you have to do now is call the court and say, I wanna reschedule my court date. I missed it, I wanna reschedule or you show up, anything you do to re-engage the court, they have to release your, um, your suspension. And they have to send a notification to DDS, the Department of Driver Services, that you are eligible to get your license reinstated. Um, and so, it, because previously you would have to resolve the entire case, the entire ticket, pay off everything, resolve everything before you got your license back. So now this allows somebody to get their license reinstated while they're, trying to work out the payment plan or the reduction or whatever it is that they need to do. Um, and this bill that passed also expands the fee waiver. It's called a pauperous affidavit. Um, and it used to just cut fees for reinstatement in half to 50%. And now it's 100% if you meet the eligibility, the, the income criteria. So if somebody has a suspended license, the, all they have to do is call the court and say, you know, I want to reschedule my court date. 
And then they have to, the court will release the suspension and then, but you have to then go to DDS to get it reinstated in person. You have to pay the reinstatement fee or the judge can waive the fee or you can use the fee waiver, the poppers affidavit for to get that, um, those reinstatement fees waived. So um, that's kind of what other things the DGP does. Just remember the pardon, the expungement, we help with those, but they're not related to voting. We do that to remove barriers to employment and housing. So that is our presentation. And um, we you all did an awesome job as always. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Yep. So anybody have questions about those, the pardons or expungement? Did I answer the question about retroactive first offender that you had earlier? You did, and I also dropped the one pager link in the chat as well, and I'll make sure I send it out with the other information and I, drop I your contact info in the chat. Okay. I have a question um, with, regarding the early termination. Mm-hmm. Um, mm -hmm. if the, it was the sentencing was on the first offender and the, but the probation was served, transferred to a state like Texas, does that prevent you from Texas? applying for first offender? I'm sorry, the, uh, SB 105 for early termination. He was convicted in Georgia. Yes. Under yes. first offender. Yes, you are still eligible to apply because your sentence is um, a Georgia sentence. So yes, you could apply for early termination. Um, I think it's through the interstate compact. And I believe if you are on a website, I'm pretty sure there's that phone number for the interstate compact. But yes, it would be the same process where they ask their probation officer. Um, and I, I mean, I guess that would be a Texas probation officer. So there is a phone number to call. Um, for the interstate compact um, to, to start that process. Was that in the documents, um, a part of this Zoom meeting? I'm pretty sure it would be on our website. Um, if you send me an email, I can, I can get that for you. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. And in terms of voting rights, Oh, you're, oh no, Don, come on in, Dominique. His, his computer died, so he's gonna join my screen. Um, the, um, so in terms of voting, um, you, that person now lives in Texas, so you have to know Texas law to find out if he would be eligible to vote in Texas, because I don't know Texas voting law in terms of uh, First Offender Act or any kind of sentence. Okay, thank you so much. Sure. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Anything else to say? Thank y'all <laughs> for having us. Um, we just got work to do. That's so, all. You know, thank mm -hmm. y'all for having us. Just gotta combat misinformation in the best way you know how. And that's with the right information. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. so One thing that I'll say is. Branch.vote is a really great website. So um, it helps, you know, it helps, you know, what's on your ballot. Like you can see a sample ballot on my voter page, but branch.vote, not you put in your address and not only will it give you the sample ballot to know what is on the ballot, but it'll say, well, the public service commissioner, for example, what in the heck does that person do? How does that impact my life? And why is it relevant? And why should I care? And then it links to here are the candidates and here's a link to their websites and their positions on various issues. Here's a one line of what they do to like a one line of what the um that what they're supposed to do, like their job. Yeah, so it's a really helpful website for um, just voter education because it's scary. You know, we talked earlier about it's scary to go to the polls. It's intimidating to go like, well, what's on the ballot and who who are these people anyways? I mean, some people will get their stuff on TV or you see a yard sign, but you don't really know about them. Um, but especially when you go down the ballot to those things, it really helps. Good. Um, I'm not sure. Sure, that one. Perfect.
first attempt to hit me wrecky. <laughs> I'll put the branch not vote in the chat. Perfect. Thank you. Nuke. Let me let me look that up, Daniel. Probably some Yeah, Latin something. Now for doing to correct the ruling. Yeah, I, I don't, I wouldn't want to try to guess based on what Google is telling me. I'm not sure. Sorry. It's something about yeah. emotion right there too. So. I mean, do you have any, do you have confusion about if you're still under First Offender Act? Is that the, the question, Daniel? Sure. You can reach out with a, um, the judge said no to first offender. Oh, okay. So you were not sentenced under the first offender act. Okay. Um and that was on your sentencing paper real quick. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't want to guess to that, but you could email us and um you could email us and we could probably ask an attorney that we work with to try to get clarification for you, but well, it'll be hard to troubleshoot in the last minute and a half. <laughs> we'll talk about yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Well thank you for Alicia for having us. Um I I hope that we helped um so if you're talking to potential voters um or if you want some of the materials that Dominique talked about this yard sign behind us or you want some of these um cards to hand out or we have posters that you can post at a bus stop, at a shop window, at a bulletin board, anything like that, just reach out and we can mail them to you. Thank you so much. You all did amazing, amazing, amazing job. And yeah. before we go, we wanted to again, be able to thank our donors and our supporters, Heisen Simons Foundation, Restore Georgia, DeKalb County Public Library, Elysium Consulting, ProMed Consulting, Down Home Southern Catering, Taking Charge Consulting, Beauty and Body by Egypt, A New Way of Life, and the Hope Coalition, and everybody who donated $2, $3 here before then. We could not do this work with, without you all because we are an all-volunteer nonprofit where 80% of our board of directors are formerly incarcerated and justice impacted. So we really appreciate you all's support. Uh, it is our goal to try to get do more virtual events that will be very helpful for the folks that we serve um, we've been getting a lot of recommendations asking about um, parole, uh, parole packages, assisting with parole packages, also for family members, as well as federal parole. Um, but I also wanted to, I know that was one question that we always get, and I know, I don't know if GJP does uh, talk about it, but uh, the myth that a lot of folks are getting, for those who are on the registry, they're being told by their POs that they are not eligible, that the law does not apply to them because they're on the registry. So I just wanted to find out and get some clarification from that, that that is basically a lie. They are still eligible to have their probation terminated, even though they're on the registry, but it is to be made clear that this does not mean getting off probation early has nothing to do with getting off the registry. Now, it may help down the road. It might look good to a judge down the road when you try to get off the registry, but those are two separate things. But I just wanted to get some clarification that people who are on the registry, if they've been on probation and they're eligible for at least three years and all that other stuff, they are indeed as well eligible to get off of probation. And then what do they do when their POs say, oh, that's a lie, no, you're not. And they're refusing to even go through that process. Do you have to go through the PO or can you, is there somebody here you can go when your PO refuses to help? Yeah, I mean, the I would just refer you to our website, the gjp.org slash probation. So it does walk through that process. Um, every charge is potentially eligible. So you're right that it it's not like certain things are excluded. Um, it is though up to a judge. The judge has the discretion to um, say yes or no. Um, and judges vary wild, wild, you know, widely. Um, some are more um, willing to do that or not. It's just how the, the system works. Um, 
So, so the website, you know, it'll say like, start with your probation officer, ask them these questions. You know, it says like what you should say, what, if they say this, say that back, you know, kind of, it walks you through like how you self-advocate. And if that doesn't work, then you can email a DCS. They have an email address for the Department of Community Supervision and, you know, share what you, what you already tried, what they said, and then um, you get some response from them. If that still doesn't work, um, the judges that they're supposed to um, either respond to the order or um, request a hearing. And if that happens, you can reach out to Georgia Justice Project and we can help um, troubleshoot that and potentially, if it's in the metro area, potentially represent someone in that hearing. Okay. And I think the last question is um, that we, we always get is why do people have, why is the burden left to the folks who are being supervised to try to get certificates of completion. If you are a PO and you know that this person is no longer on probation, why though, why is that something that's not automatically triggered out, either emailed or mailed to folks? Right. Why we, you know, why, right. you know, hey, you, you you've completed high school, we get a diploma. You complete Amen. college, we get a diploma. So why is that something you foresee in the future of being done? That when people are off paper, just send them something to let them know. Yeah. Yeah. I think that. Well, some of it is because Georgia has the longest probation sentence in the country. So somebody might be on probation 10 years, hasn't, or 20 years, hasn't checked in with somebody in 14 years. They probably moved four or five times. Oh. So if they mail out something, it might go to, you know, an address you haven't okay. lived at. And then you're outed <laughs> to whoever now lives in that, that place about your past. Okay. Um, so some of it's that. But yes, why couldn't it be? available with email or, um, and I will say that DCS has a portal that they are piloting. They've been piling in it for a couple of years. There are certain counties, you can actually go on a portal and print out your own certificate. Okay. But it's only certain counties. I'm not sure why we're, we don't know why we can ask them every month. Like how come, you know, can you make this now statewide? Because that would make a lot of sense, right? I mean, they have a portal now where you have to go check in, right? For your monthly thing. So it could be the same portal where I'm off paper. I want to print my certificate. So we ask that monthly and are still advocating for that because it would be so much easier for everybody. Okay. Huh? I um, think Irma if, had a question, if that becomes we'll a out. thing where it's widespread and everybody can do that, I promise you, you will know. We will let you know because okay. it would make it easier for everybody. Well, thank you. And I think we have one question from Irma and then we'll get ready and get off. I do have a question. Arlene. You're going to find that I have a lot of, I ask a lot of questions. So. That's good. But um, if you are, we're talking about folks that are currently in jail, has there been any kind of initiative how to attack that group of uh, individuals with voting information and absentee ballots. Is there something out there to kind of grab hold of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, it has been. Um, this Georgia um, agenda. Georgia yeah, agenda. the um, Georgia Coalition for the People's Agenda does a lot of vote in person voter registration in jails, and then the Southern Center for Human Rights is mailing things to the those counties that put their jail rosters online. I think it's 14,000 people in 83 facilities. They are doing a mass mailing about voter, um, you know, here's here's your um, a voter registration form and what you can do. Um, and then other groups, many other groups are doing in-person voter registration. It all depends on how helpful the sheriff is in terms of giving people access and things like that. But there is quite a lot of groups doing that. Um, if yeah. you are doing that or know others who are, I'd love to, I mean, there we're trying to do a little more collaboration so that three people aren't going to the same jail and nobody going to the next County over's jail so that we make sure we, you know, somebody's helping every single jail. So if you or someone else, you know, is doing that, I'd love to connect you with the others. So to coordinate that. Okay, thank you. Well, thank y'all so much for joining and I will be getting up in the next 30 minutes and getting all this out to you. So you may get it at seven tonight, but you'll definitely get it tonight because this is so much easier. Um, everything was together. And of course, Ann is so thorough. She sends all of the links. <laughs> I have to look for everything. So I appreciate you all. Ann and Dominique, great job as always. And I don't know how many times I've seen this 
webinar, there's always something new. So I definitely appreciated the scenarios with the voting. And I definitely appreciated uh, more of the information uh, that was given on, uh, I definitely like the scenarios because I'm a visual person. So I tend to visual, so um, a visual learner. So I appreciate those. And thank you so very much. And I will make sure we send these the slides out as well as all of the notes. I know y'all were frantically trying to type and open all these 30 windows. So you don't have to worry about that. We're going to send these links to y'all. So thank you all so very much. And you all have a great night. Thank you so very much. Thanks for inviting us. Bye. Bye.